Well, we started a sermon series um, a couple weeks ago called Neighborhood Watch, and and as we've been saying, you know, that, that term Neighborhood Watch, it often kind of brings out a fear-based mentality, you know, that we have people around that are trying to get our stuff or trying to get us so that we've got to have a team of people to protect us, but that's not really where we're going with this series. We, we're really just looking in the Bible to see what it says about our neighbors and, uh, and honestly, what our responsibility is to them. And we began the conversation by discussing the value of human life. And um, I don't know about you, but it's kind of nice as we go through series to have a little bit of time of review because I tend to forget things. So the review may be just for me, but, but it's helpful for me to kind of understand where, where we're coming from. Um, but the value of human life, I, I think we found that our, our value of a human life is a little lacking, at least when you compare it to the way God sees human life. Um, aren't we just um, more than, nothing more than a higher form of evolutionary uh, animal life? Well, not according to God. Um, in the creation story, we found the description of how God made humanity just to be so much different from the description of how he created all the rest of his creation, um, even the animals. Now, we're not trying to lower, as we've been talking about, we're not trying to lower the value of all of the rest of creation. God's creation speaks for itself. It's just amazing as you look at his creation. You just couldn't lower um, the value of his creation. It's just amazing. But while he spoke most of the universe into existence, what did he do with mankind? He, he formed us, it, literally talking about sculpting and molding with precision, with um, detail, um, out of the dirt. But unlike animals, we humans were not just sculpted and, and put together with precision and detail, but he took a step further and he actually breathes into our lives, his breath, bringing us to life. And really there's not any other part of his creation that could say that, right? And there's, let's not forget that we were created intentionally, made out of God's own image, us humans. Nothing else in creation can say that. We are unique among God's creation. According to God, humans are at a different level than all of the rest of his creation. But do we value humanity like God values humanity? That's, that's the difficult question, right? Think about the gospel story. How important do we have to be for God to send Jesus? Have him go through all that he went through for us. And this is when we were broken. This is when we were yet sinners, right? As Scripture says. In fact, God tells us that if we want to love him, who else do we have to love? Our neighbors, right? Other human beings. And that's how we show our love to him. It's by loving his most prized creations, humans. So as we consider our neighbors, we have to keep in mind this this perspective of God's, uh, that no matter how broken they are, no matter how much noise they make on a Saturday night when you're trying to sleep, um, and no matter what kind of lifestyle that they live, God sees them as unbelievable, just amazing creations of his. And they matter to him, right? We matter to him. We're those creations as well, right? Last week, we took it a little bit further in this discussion about neighbors by looking at a very familiar parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke 10. Um, I want you to think about a question. Who is it that's the easiest person in your life to like? Think about that for a second. Actually, think about it, okay? <laughs> you got that person in mind? Now, now, who is the most difficult person in your life to like. Maybe you shouldn't be thinking about this in church, but who is the most difficult person for you to like? In this parable, Jesus goes to this difficult, 
awkward place. And he takes the ones that are the easiest to like, the ones that are supposed to be the good guys, and he makes them the bad guys in the story, right? And then he takes the outcast, the most difficult person to like, and for the, for the Jews, that's the Samaritan, right? And he makes him the hero. What a crazy story. Just turns it up on its head. What's Jesus after here? Well, he's pushing us in an area that's really difficult for us. Humans have issues with other humans. It's the way we are. We come by it naturally, don't we? We, we tend to very easily have categories, very easily have labels so that we can... It just helps us define who we like, who we don't like, right? As we talked about last week, prejudices, right? And what is Jesus doing when he's reversing the usual order of how we think about people and their labels? And he's making every label in this parable completely meaningless, as we talked about last week. Priest, Levite, Samaritan, it just doesn't matter. He mixes them all up. Or maybe he's just choosing to ignore them as if they're not important, these labels. And we see in Jesus' life that that's the way he lives, right? From what we see in Scripture, he hung out with everyone. It really didn't matter who they were. Samaritans, tax collectors, prostitutes, sick people, demon-possessed people, um, women, men, kids. I mean, it really didn't matter. It doesn't matter what label we put them on them. And the weird thing about Jesus is that he doesn't even bring it up as a point of conversation. It's not even something that he talks about. All he cares about, he doesn't even care about the labels that we give. All he cares about is us. People, humans, his amazing creations. Specifically, he'd really like to help us find God's way in living our lives. And we looked at what Paul says about those who are in Christ. I mean, it's just so weird to think about what this says. Galatians 3, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. For you are all one in Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus. No labels? How do we even navigate life without labels, right? We're all one. The only thing that matters is the label of Jesus. I mean, this seems to be the way that the kingdom of God seems to kind of operate. This is Jesus' desire for us as humanity. He wants us all to be a part of the same family. And that family is the children of God. All of us. And we've seen, over the years, we've seen some just amazing examples of this at times in the church. Sometimes we really get this right. I mean, you gather these churches together and you see all sorts of diversity, different classes, different nationalities, different races, you know, the things that we usually divide over. You can see us gathering together at times, and God wants us to do that, wants us to love all of our neighbors, right? All of humanity. But he doesn't mean really all, right? There's always an exception to the rule. Shouldn't there be an exception in this category as well? Now, again, I want to ask you a question. I want you to actually think about it. What, what group, if you had a choice, that, that could be the exception for you? What group would you not want to include in this loving your neighbor stuff? <laughs> what would be the group that you would have the most difficult time loving? Who would it be? Thinking of somebody? <laughs> Thinking of a group? Who was it for the Jews? Again, we looked at the Samaritans last week, but Gentiles, right? These Gentiles. And they had good reason for it. You think through the, the scriptures, the stories in Scripture, the Jewish people as they're becoming a people way back when, you know, um, especially as they're entering into the promised land, they were told to stay away from those other people groups, right? Primarily for the reason that the Gentiles just might corrupt their religious practices, might um, turn them away from God. That sounds serious, right? And this is definitely still the sentiment when Jesus comes around, as Jesus enters the planet, right? Jews and Gentiles, they just 
just don't get along. But the problem with this label Gentile is, is that it's not actually describing a group of people at all. It's actually excluding a group of people because the label Gentile is simply everyone else that's not Jewish, right? That's what it is. Everyone else that's not Jewish. It would be like us Christians um, excluding from our lives everyone that is not Christian. We'd never do that, right? <laughs> that wouldn't be something that we struggle with. I heard a laugh down here. Of course, it's windy because she, <laughs> she laughs at my nervous laughing. <laughs> um, but seriously, how difficult would it be? Think about this. If you were raised to see a group of people, maybe even everyone else who is not like you, that they're less than you, that they maybe are even cursed, or maybe they're even evil, that, that your very standing with God um, is threatened by you just spending some time with them. Think about that. If you were raised this way, how hard would it be to get rid of that thought process, that thought pattern? I think some of you actually can relate, probably. <laughs> Not Jews and Gentiles, but other categories, right? And imagine if you, and this one's the hard one to imagine, imagine if you were the receiver of such animosity. If you were the Gentile, if you were the one in the people group that was knowing that there's a people group out there who thinks that they're better than you. They think that you are less than them. They think that you are maybe somehow um, evil, that you are somehow cursed, that, that maybe just spending time in your presence is a threat to them. What would you think of them? Seriously, what would you think of them? How hard would it be to convince you to even hang out with them? Do you see where this is going? Do you see the, the neighbor dilemma here? The first century church struggled with this issue of Jews versus Gentiles. But do you see how practical, practical of an issue this is for us in the church? today. I mean, what would it take for us to change our view of those who weren't Christian? What would it take for God to convince us to look at things differently, to look at them differently? <laughs> Thinking that they actually have value? And what would it take <laughs> For them to change their view of us. The separation between us, those two groups, Christians and non Christians, is just so wide, isn't it? Let me ask you a question. Jesus is, is Lord of only the Jews? Jesus is Lord of only the Christians? Or is Jesus Lord of all? What does that all word mean? Who did he come to save? Just the people that we like? <laughs> They're like us? Again, what, what does all mean? So I want to take a few moments this morning to see how this Lord of all issue is worked out in the early church. Because <laughs> right there in the book of Acts, they're having some pretty strong struggles as a group. And, and as you read through the book of Acts, there, there are some really strong hints about, about this, this whole Jewish-Gentile issue. And they seem to, to not be able to catch on to those hints, probably because they've been so entrenched to thinking a certain way about them. Think about Acts 1. The, the resurrected Jesus says this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. What might that even mean? <laughs> wow, Jesus, you want us to go hunt for Jews in Samaria? 
and all the way to the ends of the earth? You think there's Jews everywhere around there? Of course there are, right? That's what it's talking about. He's talking about just going to talk to the Jews about Jesus. How about Pentecost? Acts 2. The Holy Spirit comes and what's happening? The believers are starting to, to, to speak in all sorts of different languages about the, the, the wonders of God in their own tongues. And Peter quotes a prophecy from the Old Testament, the prophet Joel, saying, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. What does all people mean? Well, Jewish Christians, obviously, right? <laughs> Wouldn't mean anyone out of the Jewish race. That would be crazy. <laughs> Skip ahead to Acts 2, because, because of the persecution in Jerusalem, um, which many scholars actually claim the church needed in order to get them out of Jerusalem and actually he headed to the ends of the earth. Um, they liked to stay home where, where all the Jews were. Um, we read a story about Philip. Verse 4, it says, Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went, and Philip happened to end up in a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there, where the crowds heard Philip. And they, when the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. I mean, we talked about Samaritans last week. Definitely not Jews, right? And this poor, confused Philip <laughs> takes off the wrong direction when persecution came, and he ends up in Samaria. And what's he doing? Apparently he doesn't know any better. <laughs> Start sharing the gospel, right? And you know what? The church in Jerusalem hears about it, and what do they do? <laughs> they send Peter and John to see what's going on. Why are you over here, Philip? Um, and you know what ends up happening? They end up preaching in, in, in many Samaritan villages, Scripture says. That definitely wasn't part of the protocol, but, but God seemed to be blessing the preaching, the sharing of the gospel. Why would that happen? Later in Acts 8, something even weirder happened um, to Philip again. Verse 26, Philip had to have been a pretty weird dude. Um, now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. Obviously not a Jew, right? And the spirit told Philip, spirit, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet and he asked, do you understand what you're reading? Well, how can, I, how can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. So who leads Philip to share the gospel with a Gentile from Egypt? Said the Spirit, actually. At least the angel of the Lord. I mean, it's just a coincidence, right? Wouldn't actually mean to do that. Um, now again, we're trying to kind of poke fun here at this, but, but this would be a tough, tough, I can't understate the transition that this mostly Jewish church back then processing through this, right? Think about it. Transitions in life, they can be pretty tough, pretty big deal, especially when they're unexpected. This would have been unexpected. Um, and really, uh, you see with someone like Philip, who is able to take transitions well, there are others who don't take transitions oh so well, right? Things, things when you start bringing the word change, uh, people get a little nervous. Um, change of heart would have definitely taken, needed to be taken place, right? Change of mind, especially after being in this routine, this idea, this thought for so, so long, Believing Gentiles were now going to be part of God's people? Just like the believing Jews? 
This is huge stuff. This is not a little thing. So we're going to look at just for a moment here in Acts 10. If you'll turn with me there. Beginning of Acts 10, we find Cornelius. Cornelius, he's a Gentile. He's a leader in the army, um, Roman army. And the true fact about Cornelius is that he's searching for the one true God. And God causes this encounter between Cornelius and Peter that radically rock the early church. Rocks the church. I mean, process this story with me. Verse 1 in, in Acts 10, at Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and, his, he and all of his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. So the Bible describes Cornelius here as good. He's moral. He's, uh, you know, they talks about him being a giving man. But he doesn't know Christ. We know people that are good people, moral people, that don't know Christ, right? I mean, that's not, not too unusual. But this is a great reminder to us that morality does not save. Jesus does, right? Cornelius then has this vision in which an angel speaks to him. Verse 3, one day at about 3 in the afternoon, which is actually one of the Jewish times of prayer, so this Gentile is practicing some of the things the Jews were. He has this vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came, up and came to him and said, Cornelius. And Cornelius, as I definitely would do, he stared at him in fear. <laughs> definitely had his full attention, right? What is it, Lord, he asked. And the angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a remote memorial offering before God. Now hold it. This guy's not a Christian. He's, he's not Christian, but God has received his prayers, received his gifts to the poor. That's an interesting detail to the story. Now send men, he's telling uh, Cornelius, now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He's staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. And there's a whole other sermon. Why in the world is Peter at Simon the Tanner's house? But that's, that's just going to get us distracted this morning. Um, when the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened. <laughs> and he sent them to Joppa. So really very few details are given to Cornelius at this point of the story, right? Um, just some simple instructions. And, and being <laughs> a man from the army, he knew how to follow instructions. So he was told to send men to Joppa to look for Peter. And that's what he does, right? What do you think his hope is here? Well, I think he's really kind of hoping that Peter might be able to shed some light on what in the world this vision is and... and, and why am I looking for you, right? That's what I'm assuming that he's wanting. He's wanting to know what the message is from the Lord. And we actually learn more about that later in the story. Verse 9. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, we catch up with Peter. Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry. It's noon, so he was hungry. And wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. And then a voice told him, told Peter, get up, Peter, kill, eat. What's the problem here? Well, the Jews don't eat all animals. They only eat clean ones, right? So what does Peter do? 14, verse 14. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. Never, by no means. No way, Jose. I mean, he just outright refuses. I'm not going to do it. I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. What's Jesus, Peter referring to? He's refer, referring to the kosher laws, right? The eating laws from Leviticus 11. Verse 15, the voice spoke to him a second time. Listen to what the voice says. 
Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happens three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. So as, as Cornelius' men are headed to Peter, there, Peter has a vision as well in, in which he's told to eat unclean animals. Unclean animals. And Peter refuses three times, right? This all happens three times, and Peter seems to like three times things, right? And, and Peter's probably assuming, as he's refusing, that, that he's being spiritual, Right? He's doing the right thing. These were God's rules, after all, about food. And then the Lord tells him in the vision, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Confusing? Yes. <laughs> Very confusing. In fact, in verse 17, Peter's still wondering about it. What in the world was that? While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped, by, stopped at the gate. They called out asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, I mean, he's, he's processing here. The Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Who is it that said this to Peter? Spirit. Not just a messenger, not just an angel of the Lord. It was the Spirit this time. Does that emphasize importance, maybe? Verse 21, Peter went down and he said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Now why have you come? The men replied, we've come from Cornelius the centurion. He's a righteous and God-fearing man who's respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear uh, what you have to say. <laughs> As a preacher, that would be pretty startling. You're saying that I need to go share a message that I don't know the message, you know. Um, so Peter finds out, obviously, that Gentile, this Gentile Cornelius um, also has this vision, heavenly messenger. Um, could we call this a coincidence? Or providence? Isn't it amazing that, that God gets so far ahead of us I mean, he's so far ahead of Peter and Cornelius trying to figure this out. He's just putting all the pieces together for them. And you think he does that still today? But look at Peter's response. I think maybe he's catching on. I don't know. What, what, verse 23, then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. That's an interesting statement in the story. Peter invites three Gentiles into his home. Now, now in all honesty, uh, for a Jew, it would be way easier, less of a risk to invite people into your house than they go to someone else's house. Why? Because you get to control the food. <laughs> right? If he can control the meal, there's a little less of a risk. Um, but definitely still frowned upon. I mean, is Peter already making connections about what God's doing in the story? The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. Um, so a crowd was gathering to hear Peter's message so that he doesn't know what he's going to say. Um, that makes me nervous for Peter. Um, but that's... Totally a personal thing for me. Sorry, just on the side there. Um, verse 25, as Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reference. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I'm, I'm only a man myself. <laughs> now just think about these two people, Cornelius, Peter. Um, the representatives from two groups of people that do not hang out together, right? Um, the Jews look down on, on the Gentiles, and the Gentiles know it, and the Gentiles probably look down on the Jews, if, if things were honest. And In addition, these guys are leaders in their groups. Both of them are important, and, and they wouldn't just listen to anyone, right? So they probably, um, you know, if they were just on their own, in their own groups, they probably wouldn't even have the conversation together, because 
They would see themselves as higher than the other person. But here they are, treating each other as equals. The centurion, this leader of the church, right? I kind of imagine like Reagan and Gorbachev getting together. I mean, there's just a big summit meeting is happening here. Verse 27, while talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. Praise the Lord. <laughs> he said to them, you are, all well, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. Why would he even start off with that statement, right? But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. Do you see what he just did? <laughs> What did he get out of that vision that was about food? It wasn't about food. It was about people. God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. And Peter continues, So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. <laughs> so may I ask why you sent for me? Great question. Cornelius answered, Well, three days ago I was in my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer, remembered your gifts to the poor. Send a Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. So what is that, Peter? <laughs> so Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. But accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. Hold it there. You've got to hold it there. <laughs> Lord of who? All. Lord of all. Jesus, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all people but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. It's kind of odd that he brought up eating and drinking, right? He commanded us to preach to the people, to testify that he's the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. Now think about that. Does that mean everyone? Living and dead? Yeah, I think that would include everyone, right? The judge of all. All the prophets testify about him that everyone, key word there, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And it's almost as if the Holy Spirit was just waiting for that statement because he starts moving on these people in this group. Verse 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on some of them, all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They've already received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. Do you see what's happening here? In the same way, Pentecost came for the Jews. 
Here the Spirit came down upon the Gentiles. The same way. God was validating the whole event. Right? And Cornelius and his family, they received Christ. They were baptized just like any other new believer. Didn't matter. Gentile Jew. In the words of Peter, God doesn't show favoritism. And a key part to the last piece there, you know, Peter stayed with them for a few days. That's a testimony. But look at what happens next. It's always interesting to see what happens next. Acts chapter 11, verse 1. The apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. And they said, praise the Lord. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them? Now that would never happen in the church, right? We would never be critical of someone else inviting someone to church, you know, being a part of the body of Christ. You would never do that, right? That's impossible. So unrealistic. I'm laughing up here, just so you know. But not in our church. I'm just talking about other churches. Verse 4. Starting from the beginning. <laughs> and it starts from the very beginning. And it's so weird, this whole story. Um, as you tell a story, you know, you think of Luke writing this story down. For some reason, he decides instead of saying, and Peter told him the story, to actually restate the story. And he does it like two times. Even though you just, as readers, just read this story. You don't need the information again. But, but what's he doing? This is important. Remember this story. <laughs> so starting from the beginning, Peter told them the whole story. I was in the city of Joppa praying. In a, trance I saw, in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners. And it came down to where I was. I looked into it. I saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds. Then I heard a voice telling me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. I replied, surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. And the voice spoke from heaven a second time, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and then it was all pulled up to heaven again. Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house when I, where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in the house and in his house and say, Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. Which I didn't hear that in the original part of the story. Did you? But here it is. Anyway, just not to argue with Peter's story. Uh, verse 15. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And what does Peter conclude from this? What's the reason for what he did? Seven, verse 17. So if God gave them the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? That's a really good question. Who am I to think that I could stand in God's way? And when they heard this, they had no further objections, which actually could be the biggest miracle in the whole story. Right, And they praise God, saying, So then even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Now again, they, they did get to argue in a few chapters later in Acts, so not everything was smoothed over. But what's the point here? God, I mean, this message that God has for the church was revolutionary. Revolutionary to the Jewish church. Up until this point, the church, again, had been made up of all Jews. All Jews. 
any thought of a Gentile joining the church would have been absurd, probably an abomination. And they would have had scripture to pack them up, right? So this was a big change for the Church of Christ. Perhaps we too, we too need to change our thinking of who God wants us to invest in. Maybe even share life with Maybe even evangelize, right? We really shouldn't just go to the people we maybe would naturally go, the people that are like us. But we should really try to reach everyone. All. The Church of Christ is really in the same way as Jesus. We should not show favoritism. As one translation puts it, God is not a respecter of persons. Everyone is invited to accept Christ's invitation of salvation. Everyone. It doesn't matter their background, doesn't matter their occupation, it doesn't matter their nationality, their former religion, color of skin. I mean, you, you name it, it doesn't matter, right? Our duty to be neighborhood watchmen <laughs> Includes giving the gospel to everyone. All means all. All means all. I mean, we <laughs> may even question God <laughs> on this at times. Why? Because we've got preconceived ideas about things. We've made up our mind on things, on who, what people deserve what, right? Who deserves the gospel? But we've got to look past those preconceived ideas. As Peter says, if God can, (laughs) we should too. We should too. Now what's interesting, the Acts narrative also implies that it's not uncommon for us to also disagree about this. Disagree among fellow Christians. I mean, think about it. If we decide as a church to reach out to those who are unloved, the ones who are not like us, the ones who are unreached, the who different cultures, whatever it is, then we are <laughs> just as likely to run into some disagreements in, even between us within the church. Maybe even uh, a different church in our community, looking down on us for being willing to reach that group of people, whoever they are. But the question is, should this hold us back from fulfilling God's mission? Should this hold us back from the proclamation of the gospel? In the words of Peter, who are we to stand in God's way? He's going. Are we going with him? All means all. And you do remember, if the early church wouldn't have made this step, then none of us would be here. Unless there's some Jews here. <laughs> right? So who is the next group of people who wouldn't be here if we don't respond. Would you pray with me? Lord, this is a crazy story. (laughs) And as usual, your word is so challenging, so practical this morning. so difficult for us to look past the things that we understand as truth that we're prejudiced about that we have an understand understanding that we shouldn't hang out with those people whoever those people are Lord would you help us to see things from your perspective you know there are times when your thoughts are just way higher than our thoughts As Scripture tells us, your ways are way higher than our ways. We just don't understand them. 
just doesn't make any sense to us. So Lord, it's in these moments where we need your help to trust you. To trust that your ways are good, that your ways are right. As we look at other human beings, that, that you see them as valuable, that you see them as important, that they matter to you, and that they are ones that you want in your family, that you want us to share the good news with. Lord, help us. Change our hearts. Change our minds. Help us to even in this be your people. <laughs> Responding in the ways that you'd want us to respond. And we will see you working in our hearts and lives. We will see you working in the people around us. Drawing them to you. And we will give you glory and praise. You're an amazing God that cares so deeply for us. Help us to care deeply about each other. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Would you stand with me as we close the service? Passage from last week, Mark 12. Jesus talking to the teachers of the law, asking him about the most important commandment. Verse 29, the most important one answered Jesus is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. People of God, <laughs> these are your marching orders for the week. And don't forget, all means all. You are sent.